Hi, my name is Kemi Ajimobi. I had an intriguing interview with the chairman of First Bank, who is also the chairperson and founder of the Chair Center, Mrs. Ibukun Awoshika. Now, she shared with me on 30 years of doing business in Nigeria, her trials, her triumph, and her success story. You will find this interview very revealing. I learned a lot from her, and I'm sure you will learn to sit back and enjoy. Well, I think that uh, if I look at it from the perspective of the Chair Center and our 30 years history, because we're 30 this year, which is why um, for us is a landmark, then you have to look in terms of how things have incrementally improved in terms of um, some of the fundamentals of the things that are uh, are being deliberately targeted by the ease of doing business uh, team. And um, essentially, it's also about what sector of the economy you're in. But there's some of the things that have been done that are general, like registering a business. Now you could almost go online and register your business. That's a major plus. I guess when I was starting 30 years ago, you needed a lawyer, you had all the ceremony of waiting for quite a while before Abuja and all of those things and stuff like that. So it's easier for younger people to register a business in 48 hours or a bit less, depending on what you're trying to register. So that has some advantages. Um, I remember some of, um, because some of our businesses, we have foreign partnership. When your partners are coming to Nigeria, all the stress between you and them to get a visa in a Nigerian embassy, away and back, to forth, back and forth and the length of time. Now with the visa on arrival option, you actually do get a lot of uh, value from doing that. It makes it at least a lot easier uh, in terms of uh, that area. So yes, there, there's some things that um, have improved. There's some things that have become maybe a little more challenging uh, as well. You know, when you think about, um, well, it, it's not even about saying certain things have become a little more challenging. It's about looking at some of the challenges over the time, the, uh, some of the policy uh, changes that uh, probably affect your business depending on the season and the time, some of the processes between, um, depending on what segment you're in. The Chair Center Group is in manufacturing. So in terms of that and our raw materials, so maybe you have some of your raw materials on list of um, those exempted from being able to get money directly from uh, the central bank. And you understand part of why all of those controls are put in place. But ultimately, as a manufacturer, you still think about how it impacts your own business. And also, maybe some of the processes, even with that, could probably be easier in order to encourage uh, manufacturing companies to stay put within the industry. Because in reality, manufacturers make a lot of sacrifice for the country. We take um, the brunt of a lot of issues. If, um, if power, its provision and its cost is a challenge, a manufacturing company feels that. If um, labor cost becomes a challenge because of um, various regulatory matters around labor, minimum wage and this and that, a manufacturing company will feel that. When there's a um, high drive for government to uh, generate revenue in taxes, from multiple sources, because you're sitting in one place as an obvious operation, you do feel that from different angles because then you're subject to uh, local government, state level, federal, and, and all of those issues. When the macroeconomic situation affects inflation and all of that, then it affects your input while it's not necessarily uh, and because of that, your customers as well are unable, because of the same factor, unable to pay a higher price because they just can't afford it, you know, and all of that. So you're dealing at both ends uh, of the game. And, 
you know, in another way, when I look at the last 30 years of the Chair Centre Group, I think about the, my workers and the people who have made it possible to build out on the dream of a young woman of 25 going on 26, to build for the long term of 30 years and build to this point. And so when things are hard, you're not quick to say, oh, let me just cut staff and all of that, because they are part of your story. You've built together, you're, you think about their families, you think about the people, real, they're real people behind all your numbers. And um, you think about the communities that you benefit just because you are in those communities and um, you make a difference to the lives of those communities because your factory is around those areas and all of that. You know, and when you have infrastructure weakness, roads and stuff like that, we suffer because movement of our goods back and forth is a major challenge. When the port isn't working and or in the last short while, 2017, 2018, when you could hardly move goods out of Apapa to anywhere, 2018 especially was bloody because sometimes you've cleared your containers of raw material and uh, for two, three weeks, you're still unable to have the container arrive at your factory because of all the factors related to the roads around the papa, the blockage on the bridge, and um, you even had trailer drivers not wanting to go to certain terminals because it would take them so long to get out with the shipment and they would be losing business and all of So there, there are multiple factors that affects uh, a manufacturing business as opposed to a services business that suffers some things as well, but um, they're not um, sitting on heavy capital asset like we have to and um, some of the things they can take quick decisions in and out it's a little more difficult to move multiple factories overnight or move your machine so you're in for the long long run when when you invest in, in manufacturing and for me that started for someone like me that started it at a very early age you have spent the better part of your life essentially my adult life you know doing that and so you can understand if I match that to my role as chair of the bank when I see my customers sometimes I can understand some of the issues and I think that brings a value because then we can think of how to ameliorate or be supportive in terms of because I'm coming from mm -hmm. the experience of uh, the manufacturer of the private sector as well. You know, first and foremost, you, you must never get into a business for a frivolous reason. And then when you get into it, there is need for commitment, focus, tenacity, diligence to drive it for the long haul. You must also have uh, some level of flexibility built into the way you do your business because if I take every decade in the past 30 years, that's three decades. And in the world that we're in today, things change sometimes in two, three years, let alone talk about every 10 years. So there's been such rapid change, changes, especially in the last 10, 15 years, even as opposed to the first 15 years. So your ability to respond to changes. I, I mean, if I think about how many policy changes have affected our business within the last 30 years at different times and us having to strategically respond to the situation then sometimes you know you just think how did we even survive that i mean i think about 2004 it was simply network news and the government announced a, a total change in policy that effectively was going to shut down our business so we started out in 1989, January, essentially as a local manufacturing company producing furniture. And along the path, based on certain um, limitations as opposed to where uh, I wanted to go in terms of the vision, 
uh, of the company, I started exploring ways for us to um, be able to produce in a sustainable manner the same quality in large volume over time. And so we started playing a combination game, which meant we we're producing some of our components locally, and then we, were, we started exploring other markets where we could produce some of our components efficiently in large volume to save us from some of the challenges of power, machinery skills, and all of those things. Otherwise, we were going to be confined to mediocre uh, production systems. So we then transited to a, to a company with a composite model. Some parts we were producing in our factory, some components we were producing from about five countries around the world, and all our components will come into our factory. We will have our own design collection, and um, we would work from our component to solve the problem of the customer. That allowed us a lot of speed to market. It allowed us uh, uh, the, uh, the opportunity to respond to volume very quickly. Because one of the things I, I did find out that became a major strategic uh, advantage for us is that most Nigerians don't, are not very efficient with planning. You know, if you're building a 10-story building and you wait till a few weeks to open the building to think about the furniture, you're going to end up buying whatever is available. So if you see that as a pattern, what you want to do is to be sure that when they have that need and they're trying to buy what's available, that you're the best of what is available and that you also have the volume that is required ready to deliver within the shortest period of time. So that made us producing from OEM factories around the world a major advantage and it helped our growth rapidly. And um, when in 2004 the government uh, made uh, an announcement that effectively shut down our ability to do that, we had to think very quickly. Now we had options. Our options were one, either we became a smuggler, which I was never going to be, because my core values did not uh, leave room for that and uh, as a Christian I'm a firm believer in the fact that you cannot take the goodness of God in the good times and when the times of challenges you forget who you are so that was not an option for me but what that uh, situation allowed was uh, for us to think about how we could deliver the value that we intended to our customer without compromising the laws of the land and uh, with that in mind was how, which led to some of our partnerships. I then approached uh, Sokwa SA of France, who were producing our office seating for us at that point, to say to them, look, we've had a change of policy in our country. I understand the government does want us to produce more in Nigeria so we can create jobs for our people. That makes logical sense. And the market will be open. So why don't you join forces with us and let us come into Nigeria and uh, set up a manufacturing company in Nigeria that can take over the, not just the Nigerian market but markets around us in terms of delivering international standard office seating. So, well, cutting a long story short, eventually they signed up for that and uh, we've had that partnership since 2004 and that factory was opened in 2005 uh, in Nigeria. We're still working together and we're still delivering the best in class office seating. Uh, from a factory in Nigeria to our market. Now, so after that, we then went ahead, instead of producing our components in CKD from other markets, we then set up another factory where we invested in um, all the necessary machinery to deliver uh, quality uh, processing of laminates and uh, other components for, for furniture. But what we did was to set it up not just to produce for us, but to be able to process for other people. Because the thing about furniture manufacturing is, it's really capital intensive. And the, the quality of furniture you deliver is very, very tied to the quality of machinery that you have. You can have the best imagination about design and everything, but your ability to execute that will depend on what you have to play with in terms of machinery and resources. So we invested in that and then uh, 
use that factory to produce for our own retail customers through our retail business, which is the chair center, and then uh, process for other factories. So other companies who are in furniture, whatever kind of furniture, because you can, from the same machine, you can produce homes, you can produce kitchen, we can produce doors, you can produce accessories of the, uh, that are based on laminates and wood and all of that. So that was another factory that we set up for that and, uh, and you, you know that another part of our business is the security doors. Okay, so we're, we're the first in the security door business in this country. I introduced um, that business into Nigeria in 1994. We saw the, um, we responded to the risk in the market. It was an accidental uh, opportunity, but anyway, we took it on and invested heavily in it over time both to redefine the product itself in terms of what is delivered to Nigeria as opposed to what is uh, pro uh, produced and delivered in Europe. So based on our local experiences, humidity, uh, electricity out output and all of that, we worked with the manufacturers in Italy to redefine the product that comes into Nigeria. And since 1994, we started installing those systems across the financial institution in Nigeria. We're still the biggest and the best. Our products are customized for this environment. And um, a few years ago, I think about five, six years ago, the company that was producing for us in Italy had some challenges. So we bought the right and the patent for uh, the product. And so we own the operation that produces for us uh, in Italy, both for the Nigerian market and for some other markets. Uh, that we um, sell the product to. So essentially, for the last 30 years, we have played an active role as a catalyst in the industry. We have not only sought to continue to build the business through thick and thin, I mean some really tough times in, in, as the economy goes uh, in whichever way, and uh, based on um, a value system and some of the things that you will and you will not you, you will do and you will not do and uh, based on uh, policies sometimes I sit back and I wonder how did we survive for this long but then you know I think about the many people that over the years have joined hands with me to build the company to where we are and the many people that have sacrificed in terms of uh, their own time their skills their knowledge to add value to what the company is. And one of the other things I did was always to, I'm a firm believer in empowering the people who work for you. So it's mm -hmm. never, never been about me because you know there's so much you know but there's so much you don't know. Yeah. And uh, I have a personal policy or that every human being is asset plus liability. Mm -hmm. You have your assets, those are your strengths, your weaknesses are your liability. And for you to succeed in life, you need asset plus asset to have success. So the asset that makes up for your liabilities in other people. So the only way you get to succeed is you find people who have assets in your liability and you empower them as much as you are empowered. You incentivize and you encourage them and you let them use their talents for the benefit of the institution. Mm -hmm.